Aloha and welcome to the one within all. You're listening to Interverse, and today it's my gigantic honor to welcome my friend Jamie Seed back to the show for his second appearance. As listeners will know, one of the things I'm most interested in with this podcast is trying to show people that by following your creative passions and trust basically being a decent and good person, the universe is going to set you up to become a legendary version of yourself. And I would say that's what Jamie Seed is, a legendary photographer in the Midwest community of festivals. And basically everybody that knows him knows to expect smiles and good vibes for both themselves and coming from him big time. So I think everyone will very much enjoy our conversation here while Jamie is making his way on the road to, I'm not sure where, but uh, <laughs> welcome back to the show. <laughs> good to have you back, dude. Hey, thanks, Chance. I really appreciate the honor, man. I love the intro, and uh, I'm a firm believer in that philosophy that you just espoused as well. So I'm so glad to be able to uh, come and uh, and testify. You know what I mean? It's uh, it's we need more of that uh, that mission statement out in the world. You know, because it's it's absolutely true. Yeah, I think the greatest thing about following your own heart, your own passions, and your own creative, unique expression to the world is an inherently free thing. It creates freedom for yourself and for your life. And it basically cuts down on all the negative influences that the world has got. The more uh, you follow that, the more the universe will almost be a healthier version of yourself in, in inevitably. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That moving confidently in the direction of your dreams, you know, it really is, you know, there's so many wise men that have repeated the same basic message throughout history about, you know, uh, like from from Jesus saying, you know, your faith can move mountains to, you know, uh, who was it? Thoreau said that quote about the, you know, uh, the uh, what the quote that I just gave or, uh, you know, the universe conspiring with you uh, once you once you move in a positive direction. You know, I was actually talking today about I don't know if you've ever read uh, a man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl. It's a classic 20th century uh, uh, work of uh, philosophy and kind of uh, 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 sociology, but uh, it was uh, Victor Frankel was in the concentration camps. He was a, a, a Jewish uh, sociologist, I believe, before the war, and he was in uh, he put the concentration camp and he studied. He kind of tested a theory in the concentration camps about having a. He believed that having a purpose, you know, once you have like a higher mission, it enables you to function at a higher level and to survive things. Like in the camp, the concentration camps, he saw the survival rate of of people that believed in something being higher than people that did not. Uh, And so I think that's part of it too, Chance. You know, as soon as you start getting into something that you love, it's like you, uh, you know, that moving positively, you know, uh, it it just, it it helps keep you going in general. You know what I mean? Once you have like a, uh, you know, an art that you're chasing or a mission that you're chasing, it's, uh, it makes day-to-day life, the the low parts easier to deal with because you, you know, and this world is hard and, and, and hurts us all, you know what I mean? It's so it's so important to have a mission, I feel like, you know, and a, a positive purpose. It's completely important. It's what fuels me every day, personally. Uh, once, I mean, what even has me doing this podcast is maybe uh, too big of a goal for one person to achieve by themselves, but I don't just want to inspire people to be more creative. I want to end all forms of slavery in general on earth. In any Amen. aspect of the past. Yeah. You know, the concentration- Mental slavery, yeah emancipate ourselves for mental slavery well that and actual physical slavery because i mean just absolutely <laughs> that's a whole other topic but you know the, what people deem uh freedom and an acceptable level of freedom definitely differs from person to person but that's one thing i like about you is you're a well-read guy and you study and espouse philosophy and particularly the philosophy of compassion and unconditional love and i think it's very interesting that dichotomy that we're going going into with, you know, your own personal development and evolution and health being connected to following your creative passions. It's almost as if the universe wants you to evolve. I think actually the universe does want you to evolve, but because we are in a point physically evolution speaking that we don't actually need to change our outside form that much because we can change from within and become an entirely different being in one lifetime and even our genetic oh, yeah. expression is dictated by you know the state of our consciousness and the quality of our thoughts so it's almost like whenever you're getting completely stagnant and you're not developing and evolving personally that's why you instinctively want to just start going for the 
addictions that are harmful to yourself because it's like your way of saying, yeah. oh, I'm not doing what I'm here to do. I might as well start speeding up the checkout process because I'm just waiting in line. Yeah. Self-destructiveness increases when you have no mission. Right. Exactly. And like when you're stagnating like that, it's like I've, I've come recently to a new understanding of that I just had like a pretty stagnant period. I've just shaken off here actually. And, uh, and like that depression, the idea of depression being a, a sign, you know, a signpost of stagnation and that like, uh, you know, it's a sign of needing to rest and rejuvenate and, and try something different, you know, shake. Like, uh, I feel like in a cre as a creative, uh, it's important to, to not get stuck in one form of creativity. And sometimes it's easy even after you do find your purpose, you know what I mean, or your mission, because uh, we're very complex humans and we all have the capacity to grow and change. And once you've learned a certain level of something, it's easy to become plateau and stagnate even in that one field, you know what I mean? And so it's, it's good. I actually got a great admonition this summer. Actually, a friend of mine did. She, uh, my friend Allison was interviewing somebody at Southern Light Flow Retreat down at Bird's. Uh, it's, it's the uh, Flow Academy they do down there, you know. And, uh, and this guy was talking about pursuing. He was, Allison asked him what, uh, you know, he was, he was a balloon artist. He made balloon animals at the festival. But he was like a multi-talented guy. I forget his name. I wish I knew it. But uh, he, he had this great piece of life advice about uh, collect eclectic hobbies. And uh, and I thought that was such a valuable piece of advice for from from for any human. You know what I mean? It's like to to don't stagnate in one art form or or one lifestyle or whatever. Because like what you were just talking about, it resonates so deep with me about. I'm a big believer in personal change. You know that we're not we we do have the ability to evolve constantly throughout our lifetime. You know what I mean? And I, I feel like it's easy to forget that coming from our traditional school system where it's all about memorization and repetition and like. I feel like your average kid sometimes gets out of, gets out, you know, out into the adult world and thinks that learning is over or that change is over because they're grown. You know what I mean? Like oh, when yeah. in fact we can all change and evolve at any point, you can analyze your belief system and throw out the things that aren't serving you. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's that self-analysis, self-reflection. It's like maintenance. It kind of needs to be constant. Like, okay, is this, you know, just cause I believe this, does that mean it actually is true? Does that mean it actually works in the modern world? And like, you know what I mean? I, I think that, okay. that mental internal evolution is really where we are as mankind and we, we have some work to do, but I, I'm encouraged because there, our capacity for change and learning is really limitless. You know, it's also, in my opinion, it's our responsibility to engage in that process because, like I said, not doing it leads to self-destruction and self-destruction leads to the destruction of everything. <laughs> it, the demise of humanity, right, exactly. It's exactly. Yeah, I love that concept. It really is. It's, it's incumbent upon us to help each other, you know, uh, help each other grow and learn and change, you know, and to speak out, speak truth to power and speak out, you know, like your truth to other people and be a be a light. You know, once you figure some shit out, at least, even if it's just a little bit, be a share it, be a beacon of, you know, of light to your friends out there, you know, and kind of we all we all kind of help help lift each other up and remind each other of, of the, you know, the positive and the magical things in our lives when sometimes get hard or whatever to remind each other what our mission is, you know. That's one thing I've really come to a new appreciation of and understanding of recently is just the, the power of community, tribal, you know, there's there's a negative side to tribalism for sure, a huge negative of, you know, kind of a, uh, in a discriminatory sense, you know what I mean? But uh, the, the positive nature of community, I mean, the, what we can all do together, you know, no, you know, it, our capacity we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what we can do as a, as a community if we can all get together as a human race you know and get get off of these petty differences and tribal tribalism differences you know um I we could know, change everything. At this point. no we could change everything and i mean everything including our physical yeah. bodies we can literally evolve our physical bodies in the current lifetime we're in not in a technological way but in an epigenetic way there's all kinds of all kinds of research out there about the way that consciousness affects biology and uh, research out there about how intention and consciousness and energy affects water and how water itself is an information storage system. And uh, lastly, there's quite a bit of research in the last 50 years about the interconnectedness of everything and trying to explain quantum mechanics and the best explanation I've been able to find is basically tied right in with what the ancient occultists would have said, which is that there's a 
energy field that literally interconnects everything. And they've done plenty of, there's people that have done experiments, I should say not plenty because it's kind of not widely accepted by science still, but you can do experiments that show that in a complete vacuum of as close to absolute zero as you can get, there's still an effect of energy transfer between subatomic particles and something else. So that means there's energy entering the supposed vacuum, the supposed complete absolute zero uh, place. And that's coming from what they're calling the zero point energy field. And that field yeah. is part of what interconnect is the thing that interconnects all life and all energy. And in, even is possibly what consciousness is emanating from too, because it, they can't find a correlate for memory in the brain, for example, that it, there's no part of your brain that memory is stored in. It seems to me more like memory itself is part of this quantum field, and that's why things tend to happen the same way um, over and over again. It's because that's what nature is used to doing. It's like cutting a groove. It's just the same way as your mind right. forms actual neural pathways whenever you have a habit, whether it's good or bad. So by collectively changing from within and evolving our personal outlook on the world and our exercising of right over wrong and... Uh, you know, st using truth as the authority instead of um, making authority the truth, we could actually physically change the tendencies of our reality. It's potentially possible. But what is definitely possible is we could change the, uh, the development of our biology and we could be much stronger, much smarter, much more than we are. We could actually see the fact that we are all one, the way that someone sees in like a, a psychedelic plant medicine state but we can see that all the time. And then we would actually be able to have the social harmony and cohesion that's the positive aspect of tribalism come back to us that our ancestors, I think, inherently had and took for granted probably because they didn't know there was another way. Right, right, yeah. I feel like we do need it. You know, there is an archaic return coming like that thing Terrence McKenna talked about of, uh, you know, the, the positive aspects of community-based tribalism of back when we, you know, for a vast majority of human history, we lived in small groups and we're bonded tightly with small groups of other people like us, you know, and I don't know, it seems like maybe with this plant medicine revival as, as we, uh, you know, as we go into the future, hopefully we can join tech, modern technology and ancient natural plant medicine, psychedelic technology. And I feel like, you know, we could, we can move mountains and do great things if we could use those two, the power of those two together, you know, it's unfortunate that right now we're still living in a, basically a taboo, prohibition society with regards to psychedelics because there's so much incredible potential for positive human change on a on a molecular level almost like you were referring to you know just from the fusion of of uh, uh like like for example a modern day a modern day uh shamanistic ritual with modern technology which is in essence in my mind what a great you know a great festival should be you know what i mean it's a yes. it's just the, the, the joining of modern technology with ancient primal uh, traditional uh, uh, psychedelic ritual, you know, and so uh, and also that's actually one of my of my life missions passage too. The festival is yeah, yeah, it's, of course, yeah, it's it's definitely become. I mean, I think that kind of was passed down. Like the, they say, the Grateful Dead, whenever they you know their epic thirty year tour, that that was like to so many people, it was a return of the ancient rite of passage adventure of of adulthood. Of you jump off from your parents' house and you go on a summer tour with the Grateful Dead and hop run away with the circus, so to speak, you know, and huh. I feel like modern festival culture has, has supplanted that in a, in a good, uh, probably a more sustainable and, and safe way, you know, um, than what the, what the dead tour was about at a certain point, especially in the eighties when they blew up and got, you know, hustlers took over the scene or whatever. But, um, I actually feel that yeah, I first contacted my true self, um, you know, for the first time since maybe my childhood with my authentic self. I think the first time that ever came back to me and I start and I actually started to wake up from mind control <laughs> and figure out what I wanted to do and start getting more free and more creative. And, you know, all, the things that come along with that was actually from a music festival. I went to a oh. in 2013 and while I was there, I, I had my first LSD experience, something I've been very um, cautious with because it's so powerful, but it, Immediately, who I wanted to, who I was, and what I was here to do. And as soon as I knew, I could never not know that. So even though I drug my feet a little bit in the implementation, and it took me a few years to actually learn the skills that I needed to, and 
find my direction. I knew what I want. I knew what I was here for. You know, it's what we're all here for. It's the mission of just making this place better than when we found it. Oh, can you repeat that? We got some reception issues there, buddy. Oh, I was just saying. It's really cool that idea that you, to hear that, that you uh, you know you woke up at Wakarusa, uh, so to speak. That that point is to be here. here. You know, I I went there for many years, had many transcendental experiences on that mountain, and uh, you know, ended up working working for the festival, taking photos towards the end of it. But, it's like but, the uh, sacred mountain that's wonderful. of mythology. Absolutely, man. I really feel like you know that's the the stuff of myth and legend. You know, we're kind of living, uh, you know, the uh, modern the modern these are modern rituals, modern ceremonies. Uh, we just have to look at them. We don't look at them through the lens of history and ceremony and tradition like because it's not attached to our religion strictly you know what i mean like i feel like we kind of like the festivals i mean what you repeat that sentence too we got a little bit of uh drop out i can edit these i can edit those out technology oh it's okay the technology is getting in our way man I, i'm going through a, a a one or two bar area but what i was saying was uh you know, I, I just, I really love the idea that, that you woke up at Wakarusa because, you know, I, uh, that, that place is near and dear to my heart for so long. You know, I, I went there every year in Mulberry Mountain, you know, went in Kansas before they moved. And, uh, I feel like that's that moment, like what you just described, uh, the, the wake up moment, psychedelic revolution of the mind is, uh, is in essence, what to me, in my mind, what a good festival, the goal of it should be is to create thousands of those moments for the attendees, you know what I mean? Uh, more so than to make money or to have a have a killer rock and roll show, you know. I think that's all secondary to the to that expansion experience, you know. Yeah, I think it's the festivals that do recognize the transformative power that they have that end up being the most significant in our lives consistently. I mean, a festival oh, yeah. like Wakarusa, I think a lot of people would have had uh, could have easily had mystical experiences on that mountain more than not. But it's still, um, you know, there's places like Envision Festival in Costa Rica where they are all out trying to create the space for transcendent experiences. And then there's, a, there's, you know, that can go too far into some new age stuff that is actually not real. But Right, even, right. In a little bit, could be a it's little. worth exploring yeah, anything, really. though, that's outside of the box, in my opinion, because you, you're there to make up for your mind for yourself about what you want to integrate right on yeah at least it's offered to you you know uh, like I, i've known I've, i know some festivals have caught some flack for offering especially the more west coast transcendental type festivals have get caught flack in the community for offering you know seminars by authors who have been long since debunked for slinging fake science and stuff like that you know but you know whatever i mean it's it's all part of the experience and you got to learn how to be discern have discern and, and uh you know so in a way i feel like maybe you know maybe that's that's a healthy offering as well just because it's you know, teach you a thing for yourself if nothing else. But I will say, I love, I, like you said, you know, Wakarusa really uh, was was a little bit more of the mainstream side of festival production as far as it goes. It was a massive, massive party, but they didn't put a whole bunch of focus on making a transcendental experience versus what I consider to be the the newest and and, and most interesting influence where they go or like the Envision in Costa Rica where they. They really, the, the promoters or the producers, I should say, the impresarios are trying hard to create an experience that will change life. You know, it's, it's, it's fine in small details like what the forest tries to do in the Sherwood Forest area, you know. And uh, uh, I think Backwoods is pretty good at that. You know, like they're, they're, I remember running to you at Backwoods that first 2015 year, and they're, uh, their curated uh, uh, artistic production level is pretty, pretty high. That's, that's got to be one of my favorite. Um, it's come to be one of my favorite subjects to discuss and to, to, to learn about, you know, just that uh, transcendental festival production. You know, I'm, I'm getting fascinated with, with that idea. Uh, I'd, I'd love and, it. Uh, trying to bring some of the West Coast ideas into that uh, direction, you know, because on the subject what? of Backwoods, they, they're coming to Mulberry Mountain now. That festival's moved from Oklahoma to Mulberry Mountain. And to me, it's almost like symbolic of the resurrection of the spirit of the festival that was Wakarusa. Because even though that festival wasn't 
organized and promoted as a transcendental festival. The fact is the people that live around Arkansas and go to festivals are super heady spiritual gangsters, like a lot of them. That's right, man. Magical, magical people in the, in the, our Midwest tribe, for sure. We, we know how to do it. You know, we've built a, we built a community that's pretty amazing, you know, from the circus performer kids that, you know, the fire, fire artists, the flow artists to the, the we world. have so many incredible musicians and, yeah, I agree completely. I feel like it's a symbolic spiritual rebirth as well. And I'm really excited. I've been pretty involved with their production planning and stuff and uh, really looking forward to, to seeing that happen on the mountain. It's going to be a, a magical, amazing thing, I, I feel like. There is a crazy powerful spirit of freedom and creative expression and unity consciousness that's emerging out of the festival culture in this area. And that's why I really would kind of like to see some more moderate sized festivals that were taking that direction. Honestly, when festival goes get to be too big, then all of that kind of goes out the window and, and a lot of people die and it, shit gets weird. And I think it's because how much money comes into it. I agree. Things. But on the Money is such how, a corrupting influence. Like the subject of fire performers and flow arts and just the creative amazingness of people around our area. I've been to festivals on the West Coast. I've been to a festival in Costa Rica and the, I've seen you know professional fire troops in those places too. And just the the random guy that walks up into the fire circle at uh, Hillberry in Arkansas, a festival with a couple thousand people, is better. I mean, not that it quali- qualitatively better, more entertaining to me, doing tricks I've never seen, and stuff that is innovative compared to, like, the pros that are out touring the world. Right. Nothing against the people touring the world. I'm just saying, like, we're some damn good – performers oh we got some badasses i agree i agree we we have some incredibly monstrous flow artists in our area and you know like the uh, arkansas circus arts crew and the got the got flow crew and the you know there's just so many you know camp cat dog and that whole big old flow art uh troop from all over the place that congregates in the midwest festivals they just badasses you know i had the good fortune of going to shoot uh southern lights flow academy i talked about earlier uh mentioned earlier that you know, I've never seen so many badasses, uh, you know, and the flow artist, it gave me a new, a really a deeper, much more, more realistic understanding of how difficult that stuff is that they're doing. You know what I mean? I was watching like, uh, you know, Boy Scout or, or uh, Megan McFadden leading these dragon, dragon staff workshops and different things. And, you know, you're seeing these instructors doing these moves and then a whole class of people who to me also look like badass flow artists, but they're like struggling with these tricks because it's very complex you know, precise movements that they're doing with all these okay. things. I guess I just haven't never really delved too deeply personally into the flow arts. It's uh, from the outside. I, I feel like I've gotten a deeper appreciation here lately, but it's such a beautiful art form, you know, and, uh, and they've developed that community over the years uh, into something really, really special, you know, performing it ties very in what we were talking about. Like, okay. It ties in yeah. T- it seems like they found their bliss, you know? Well, uh, and the fact that, you know, engaging with multiple avenues of creativity, diversifying your activities in that way. Flow arts. Oh yeah. Like so many of them are are on multiple props. That's a great point. Chances. I talked about that after we got that excellent quote about pursuing eclectic hobbies. Uh, That was at that festival. And yeah, so many of the, I noticed that so many of the best instructors and and ones that were high performing were, were very proficient at multiple props, you know, instead of being like, I'm a dragon staff artist. You know, they're Dragon probably Staff, a pretty uh, good painter too, or a pretty good guitar. Yeah, player. you know, it's like the right, world, right, you know, exactly. All of them. That's very true. Just that flow state. You know, the more you can get into that flow state, and uh, you know, there's improvisational musicians that have told me before. You know, that basically it's more of an art of just letting go and flowing than it is of you know, learn. You know, there's there's definitely a te- technical craft to all of that, but at a certain point, you just have to let go and just let it flow, you know, and uh, I see how all those things connect together for sure. And that's sort of, okay, and so that's what I would consider letting the field of dynamic conscious intelligence that we're all embedded within that some people call God, but there's way too limiting of a description and it's hard to even describe it. But this field that, that you know, has patterns energetically and in, in it, it, that's where the flow state is coming from you actually like literally get into a flow with the energy of the universe around you and so that's why it can be tied into music and you're flowing to music because the vibration of the music is now in information in the energy field that's around you that you can tap into and synchronize with and 
Also, the right fact on. that so many people are getting so good at stuff like hula hooping and fire staff and the and there's more and more of these blow toys coming up and every year it seems like there's more people that are better at it and there's new things happening. It's I think it's because the more people that are doing something and they're good at something, the easier it is for somebody else to get up to their level and start innovating. And that's like, that's a fact. I've seen it over the years with just hula hooping as one example, how the average hooper has, has evolved into something really amazing at festivals compared to just five years ago. Oh, I totally agree. I think about that a lot when I see these flow artists and remembering 10 years ago, 15 years ago in the festival world, when Flow arts didn't really exist. You know what I mean? Like there was a point not that long ago where like straight cheese incident concerts and girls with hula hoops was like a, an anomaly instead of the norm. You know, it was like, you know what I mean? Like they were the crowd that had the hoopers and, uh, and it's just exploded in its most beautiful way. And I love too how in a sense there, you know, a lot of those uh, flow art, uh, flow props are, are formerly weapons of destruction, you know, that have been, you know, like as it's kind of a beautiful thing to me to see that like these these weapons of violence and destruction have been like brought into this more gentle modern age as as toys of flow and 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 beauty. You know, uh, but still, I mean, I feel like if somebody gets really good at the rope dart, they could still fuck somebody up pretty good. You know what I mean? Like if things did get to the point where we needed some some hand to hand combat, you know. Uh, so it's kind of funny. It's like psychedelic warrior training in a way, you know. But uh, that's it's so benign and, and it was beautiful. Jamie. The self-defense principle, what? the self-defense principle has been on my mind a lot as equally important to the non-aggression principle. And oh yeah, you yeah, know, totally. And it's actually you know on the subject of how flow arts, how flow toys came to be from weapons in a lot of instances. I actually learned that nunchucks were a farming tool, and the reason <laughs> why they were used by commoners it was in like militia style rebellion against the state because the state took away all the other weapons. So they got oh, wow. nunchucks, which they were originally using just to like beat and thresh stuff or something like that. Um, but you know, it is interesting on the subject of our responsibility to evolve. That also includes responsibility for our own protection of our own rights, you know, like uh, our own. Absolutely. Our, <laughs> I, 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 no we, I'm sorry. That. I don't mean to step on it. No. Yeah. You're good. Uh, man, yeah, that's so crazy you mentioned that, Chance, because I just this season started really tripping on the idea of uh, of bringing out some, uh, some like, jiu-jitsu training or basic, like, self-defense martial arts type workshops to a festival because I feel like that that aspect is so lacking in the offerings that we've, that we've made, you know, so far as a festival tribe and culture because, like, you know, we all are nonviolent, you know, uh, psychedelically open-minded, peace-loving people, but you know, there is a very basic value in, in knowing how to protect yourself and your, you know, your people, your family, your children, you know, your tribe. And uh, I don't know. I think that that's, uh, that's totally within the, within our rights and responsibilities sector of being human, you know, uh, is just, oh, yeah. you know, being, being able to incapacitate a predator or a bad person, you know, because there are crazy bad people, obviously. Uh, I think we're all, you know, shooting blanks unless we do have it. I feel like I'm, I'm pretty short in those ca uh, capabilities for sure. Um, Me too, man. I, I don't even have a gun and I feel very strongly that I should. Not that I ever expect to need to use it and it's the last thing I would ever want to use. But I think that it's very well stated. Although I'm not a statist or a believer in the government in any sense, the founders when writing the Bill of Rights in the Second Amendment made it very clear that it is, it is necessary to protect the state of freedom, to have a well-maintained militia. And the definition of militia is not an, a group of people that get together that are hicks and like to shoot guns. And, uh, right, right. Or army surplus. <laughs> militia <laughs> yeah. the entire people. Militia actually is defined as the entirety of the people who are capable of bearing arms. And that means basically all men and women. Yeah, right on. It's necessary to right defend on. the state of freedom because – you know, that's one thing they're not able to get done in this country is all the gun control legislation that they're so clearly trying to push with the hyper sensation. Oh, that's it's it, crazy. It's so impossible. Yeah. I mean, that, what, that's to me, that's always the paper tiger because it's like, I mean, and I've definitely argued about it before and I regret it, but like the, the, you know, do we have like five guns for every man, woman, and child in our country? Like they're not going anywhere. You know what I'm saying? No. Like, I don't see why, 
I mean, and they shouldn't go anywhere. I feel like we should be more careful with our guns, you know, and we do, we're a pretty, you know, trigger happy country in general, but I feel like our problems are much more spiritual than they are based on guns. You know what I'm saying? Like we, yeah. we could, you know, in the, the, it, let's just imagine a thought experiment the government does put through a law to uh, somehow blanket sweeping law to take all of our guns. The manpower and money and violence that it would take to do that versus what it would take to like maybe invest in our spirit a little bit, you know what I mean? And try to like get people on the same page spiritually and, and not follow in one religion, but like actually take care of our society, take care of ourselves. You know what I mean? Like so much, Oh, it just turns out that so much of our violence and misery is coming from the absolute poorest corners of our ghettos in the cities. Like what a surprise, you know what I'm saying? Like, we've got to invest in changing that or it's not, you know what I'm saying? Like at the end of the day, so much of the gun violence is coming from these, the, you know, the, the, the most miserable poor corners of the darkest inner cities. And, and like, seems like rooting out the, the, the self-loathing and the, uh, and the, uh, multiple levels of multiple generations of extreme poverty and taking care of those ghettos. And, you know, that would be a lot more feasible to me. Oh, you know, yeah. and, and just getting on a page of like, we, you know, I don't know how to do that. It would be a blanket change as well. But like, we just, I mean, I feel like spiritually as a society, we're pretty bankrupt because we get, we get marketed to constantly in our capitalist society. Day one by, by corporations to sell us things. So they make us feel like we don't have enough. We're lacking or whatever, you know? And so I feel like that's a big part of our like mental issues as a nation is that we, we have this impossible American dream programmed into our head and it's all these expectations and all these myths that have been, that we've been brainwashed to, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and, you know, part of the heartbreak of growing up in America is just kind of in a way waking up to the Santa Claus delusion that you've been spoon fed to childhood that like, that we're good in the world, you know what I mean? That like that we're the champions of goodness and freedom and that like, like we all are entitled to a house with a white picket fence and a fucking, you know, Oh, dude, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Santa as a perfect metaphor and timing for right now. What is so ridiculous about the whole Santa Claus thing to me is that if you just do a little bit of research into the symbolism of Santa Claus and the history of it, it's actually all Saturnian symbolism, which is all satanic symbolism. And the entire point of promoting Christmas isn't what people assume as, oh, of course, they, you know, the corporations do want to promote commerce and, uh, cap, you know, they're capitalists, so they do market Christmas really heavily to get everyone to spend a lot of money. But, you know, that makes sense in a capitalist society. Actually, no. Sure. <laughs> it's a lot more insidious than that. The entire point of Santa Claus is to brainwash you into believing that the state is going to take care of you. And the reason for this yeah. is because as a child, you are told that there's a magical man who's going to bring you everything that you want if you're good. And then you <laughs> on the lie that your parents willingly do this lie on you and tell you about this magical man who you didn't find right, and trick you. They like violate their basic trust in the child by like just blatantly lying to them and tricking them in, into behaving a certain way for this, for this lie that they're pushing. You know? <laughs> okay. And a lot of kids do not find out that Santa's not real until seven, eight, nine. The first seven years yeah. of your life, you are a sponge that receives everything that you experience as programming. So what you're being programmed with is that your parents are not the source of your well-being and happiness, but an outside entity is named Santa, which is actually an anagram for Satan. And your unconscious mind <laughs> actually does know that and does make that connection. Not that Satan is a real entity, but that's just the symbolism here. And <laughs> so then not only do you have the programmed uh, dependency on the external fictional entity, which then just transfers over to the state when you're older, especially if you have any kind of abandonment issues from your mother or father, which everybody does in some capacity, whether it's spiritually, sure. emotionally, whatever, it automatically sets you up to believe either you need a strong father figure in your life. And so you want a, re a Republican view of the government to take care of everything uh, by force and stay out of your business otherwise, or you were missing a motherly energy. So you want uh, the state to be your nurturer and take care of every little thing and be a nanny. But either way, you're being programmed from childhood to believe in this system just from the whole Santa Claus myth and nobody even sees it. It's, it's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> 
dude. I mean, I mean, I mean it really is. I'll tell you what, Chance, I've had, I've had <laughs> some ex- one experience that relates to kind of the, the, the disillusionment of what you're saying right there. Uh, I worked at Disney World years ago, and I've been a Disney fan since I was a little kid, like so many of us are. You know, you get programmed with Disney shit from day, <laughs> you know, day one of your life. And uh, <laughs> so, I, you know, I, and I had a wonderful experience working down there. And I'm not like a Disney conspiracy theorist or whatever, but uh, I just had, I went to the Magic Kingdom. The last time I went down to Orlando and hung out with some of my buddies that still live around there and work there and stuff, uh, one of my buddies gives tours. And uh, so he hooked me up with a ticket and I, while he was going to give it a tour. And I went to Magic Kingdom, which is like the original park there, you know. And uh, it was like my first time going there as an adult. You know what I mean? Like aside from working there and like partying with my friends. Whatever, is this I've Orlando been there or California? In, in Orlando. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and I just, man, I had, the, I had my experience with it when I went in there as an, a deprogrammed adult, right? So like it, I'm coming at it from the other end of the spectrum of like, you know, I haven't been immersed in all this you know, all their, their marketing and product stuff for a long time, you know, as, a, as an adult without kids, you know what I mean? I'm not like, not like knee deep in Disney shit like I was when I was a little kid, right? So like going in there deprogrammed, it was really bizarre because I saw it without the illusion a little bit more and it kind of disturbed me, you know what I mean? I saw all these people spending all this money and all these gift shops and these kids that are like worshiping Mickey basically, you know, and like the parents are like throwing their money away for these kids to like worship these false idols and these characters and shit like, everybody's wearing the regalia you know what i mean like it's it just all of a sudden struck me as very fucking weird you know and uh and uh really kind of uh uh ritualistic in a in a in a real greedy greedy way you know and so anyway that that experience of kind of the disillusionment of being in magic kingdom is kind of like almost how i've been experiencing christmas lately man like i still get into it for like the, the family and friends you know it's so wonderful to like connect with family and friends during the time but like the, the insane amount of commercialism is, uh, it's just, uh, it's disillusioning. You know what I mean? Like you got to the point where Christmas yeah. propaganda kind of creeps me out, you know, like it's, uh, uh, you know, I mean, in a way it's, it's, it's easy to think about all the, all the oppression that happens around the world for the, to get the, to get the toys that we're pushing and the, the, you know what I mean? Like Those it's uh, a place yeah. come from people being enslaved and, yeah, basically worse conditions than what we have. But you know, people here are just as enslaved. They have how much how much time do those parents have to spend in an office uh working for half of their paycheck to go to taxes anyway that they don't even know what they right. for for them to be able to afford the trip to Disney World and buy all the plastic shit for the kid for the kid to worship. Right. It is actually right. It's lit, what you're describing, and I love the way that you described it, and just the very real way of seeing what was actually happening from an unconditioned state. That actually is a satanic cult that you're witnessing, and the majority of people are involved in it. And the reason I call it satanic is because basically the average person in this in this country, in this civilization, probably in this world, has become infected with the idea that morality is relative. And that you can basically decide for yourself what's right and wrong for you in your life. And while there's plenty of freedom of choice for a lot of things in your life that you that you would be right with multiple choices, the fact is there are some things that are definitely flat out wrong, like the enslavement of other beings in general. So the fact that right. like this whole system is driven by um, mass amounts of suffering, both human and animal, and that everyone believes in it ritualistically and it is formed by a hierarchical control structure. All of these things are, and that's the government, which is also believed in like a religion and people don't see it as a religion. But this whole thing is just the same exact type of religion that existed in like, you know, pagan Rome, where there was a, there was a, where the government was a belief system then too. But people just don't actually, they think they have the illusion of the things becoming separated because as institutions, they seem to be separate, religion and, uh, and government. But government itself and money and the commerce system itself is the biggest religion on the planet, aside from the idea that there's such a thing as authority in man, which also is a false uh, religion. <laughs> in reality, everyone only has authority over themselves, and that means that they have the responsibility to choose right from wrong when dealing with other people. And it's that simple. It's just that simple, the conscience that is required to not be satanic, but a lot of people will actually argue to your face that that's not true, that they actually have the right to decide for themselves 
what is true and what is not, which is basically like saying I'm God. Right, right. Subjective I truth. I don't want to be like too negative, but <laughs> not a lot of people <laughs> go there with me in a conversation. So I, I appreciate it. <laughs> no, I'm with you, man, for sure. For sure. That's an interesting concept, man. Yeah, and it's not like it's worshiping an entity called Satan. I just don't know a better word for it because in the Satanic Bible, that's like the key tenet is that you get to decide for yourself what the truth is. Uh, do what that will is the whole of the law or whatever, right? Yeah, and, you know, there's another way, of a, I think. another way of interpreting that would be to do what the higher will commands, which is that inner voice of conscience, and that is the law. That's the way I interpret it to be the, the positive interpretation. The conscience is the law as opposed to some rule written on a piece of paper somewhere. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is the conscience, uh, which knowledge, knowledge of, uh, knowledge of what you're doing, you know, the conscience well, con is an interesting entity. It means knowing together because con, the root word con is together. And the word, the second part of the word comes from skiere, which is to know. So it's a field that has living memory that we're all interconnected by. We, we, we all kind of know what's, what's right, what's supposed to happen. And it's like a matter of breaking that internal draw, the intuitive draw that we all have. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not perfect for sure. That's one thing I always have to make clear whenever I get all black and white about <laughs> morality and truth, but because it is black and white, that doesn't mean that I'm perfect, but, uh, it, I don't know. I, oh, right. Yeah. As a human, it's a constant process of keep trying to keep in the mean, you know, back and forth across the middle. Like sometimes you kill it, sometimes you fuck up, you know, it's <laughs> like we all kind of know what's right and wrong, though, I feel like. You do unless you've killed your ability to feel and care. Yeah. And that makes you yeah. a psychopath, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. And the world can do that. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard out there for a pimp, you know, like <laughs> <Yeah. What's laughs> that up I can see how people, you know, I mean, it'll, the world will make you hard sometimes, you know, but you know, go back Especially to those inner cities. Like I was talking about earlier to be more, to get back to kind of a more positive direction. The solution to all this is to start listening to your own inner voice, which you can strengthen by following your creative passion while also freeing yourself from the, the societal forms of slavery that most of us are caught up in. I haven't done it yet. Right I still have to go to a job and pay taxes and uh, pay a mortgage, but I'm, I'm going to get there. <laughs> I hear that, man. I, I actually just kind of fell into a situation where I get to impact people's minds, like on a, on a job level for the first time. And uh, it's a, it's a, that teaching is a subversive activity. It's kind of, you know, I'm understanding that on a new level, but uh, uh, I feel like, you know, that's, that is the remedy though. You know, it's the, you know, education, opening minds, you know, uh, uh, that whole idea of, uh, I think it was the Dalai Lama said, you know, we could, we could remove war in a generation if we taught the kids to meditate. Uh, I think that's the answer to a lot of our basic society issues is like getting the kids, you know, just think about how beautiful concept it is. You know, think of the idea of teaching a young inner city child how to meditate and quiet the mind in the midst of that chaos around them, you know, it's like what a valuable asset that would have to be to be able to teach them the, to, to find their center and, uh, and be able to be at peace from a young age before the, the pressure of that world destroys their mind. You know what I mean? Like, or, or uh, uh, pressure lead them down dark paths, you know, I think that really could have a huge impact. Uh, Practically invested some money. Yeah. You know, and it's not something anybody is going to be perfect with like listening. Now, if you haven't developed that superpower or you, you know, you've, you've neglected that practice. Hey, I'm right there with you. I've, been struggling to get it done every day myself but even if all you can do is three minutes sit down three or five minutes i wouldn't even recommend going oh, more dude. Than minutes a day i feel like if you can i mean it's, it's almost like catching one of those micro naps you know what i mean like you uh -huh. ever catch that perfect tiny nap that like it just totally rejuvenates you i feel like that's meditation to me is like the, uh, the, the most huge impact is when you can just basically even get one second of that quiet mind. You know what I'm saying? Just going from never having experienced it to like that single moment of, you know, just touching base with the infinite there of like, at the end of the day, all is well, no matter what, you know what I'm saying? It's getting that quiet place once, I don't know, because then it's accessible on some level, you know, or at least you know it's there. It takes the pressure of time. But yeah. Off. You know, you're like, yeah, man. Food from the time pressure thing. 
Um, unless you're sitting there thinking about time the whole time you're meditating, but that's a good teacher in itself because that's not very pleasant and you'll eventually correct that. <laughs> but you know, it's just yeah. like with, uh, oh. with creativity, having a daily practice causes your subconscious mind to be thinking about your creative process, even when you're not doing it. And so when you sit down to paint or you go to play your guitar, or you pick up your camera, you're more inspired, more rad- readily. You have an idea more quickly. You get into the flow more easily. Same goes for meditation. Even if it's just a small daily practice, it causes your unconscious mind to be programmed with something useful that it's retaining and coming back to and refreshing every day. And it's also like rebooting the computer. Yeah, I agree. Flush it out. Yeah, it's like that. uh, You ever read that Artist's Way book or done that? It's like a workbook thing called The Artist's Way. And uh, this lady that that created it, it's like kind of guides you through it rejuvenating the creative process basically but it has this great uh practice that's that's prescribed for, throughout like while you're working that program and uh it's called the daily pages where you just basically sit down in the morning every day and write like just freestyle whatever's coming out of your brain without any hesitation for like five minutes you know and uh it's just like a like like you said a computer reset just kind of like dumps all this gibberish that's in your brain and then it's, it's, it has an effect like meditation in a way. It's like, it's like a reboot. You, you dump all this recycle bin and then hit the restart, you know. And, uh, but also a lot of cool ideas come out of it because it sort of trains your brain to go into the flow state like immediately. Mm-hmm. Because it's like stream of consciousness writing is what she recommends doing. It's just like, like hit, let the pencil hit the pad and don't, don't pick it up. Just write. You know? And that actually will it's help an amazing practice. Other, other practices. Like, just oh yeah way. it's like you said it just turns on the flow state in the brain you know um, it could be it one, gets of the, you in that. one of those multiple techniques that you want to have cultivated eclectically you know yeah absolutely absolutely yeah i highly recommend that book if, if uh, you've ever or if anybody listens never checked it out uh the artist way is really cool yeah i uh personally was taught meditation as an adult in a class in college that the entire class was that we would sit and meditate as a class for 10 minutes or so at the beginning of the class, which I had had no experience with. And then we would do some free writing stream of consciousness style writing. And then beyond that, the requirement for the class was that on a daily basis, five days a week, you spent like five or 10 minutes writing anything. Didn't matter anything. It could even be work for something else that you're writing. So that was one of the most life changing tools that I ever picked up was the, not just that meditation was a tool, but that a daily practice of anything will carry you in the direction of that thing always. Right on. Yeah, I dig that. I dig that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm terrible about, you know, finding time to meditate every day for sure. But it seems like the, my most flowy stages have been when I did dedicate to that, to that uh, discipline. You know what I mean? Just like finding that just a little moment for a spiritual second there. Well, you know, it's a tool, right? And whenever you're using a boat, for example, as a tool and you reach the other shore, you can't just keep riding the boat. It's not that meditation is not going to be useful for life, but there does come a point where you're more naturally in that state of self reflexivity and you have other practices that cultivate it beyond just sitting and breathing. And you know, whenever you need to just sit and breathe and reconnect to the limbic system of your body and get your actual biology back in whack um you know get the negative energy out whatever you know that especially if you're in a self-reflective state so i think uh you know you don't have to keep up the daily practice with meditation ad infinitum you get out of the boat at some point (laughs) (laughs) right yeah for sure this it is definitely a great tool to have in the arsenal though you know like uh, yes uh, in times of crisis for sure being able to find that center but yeah, the idea of go, like applying that kind of uh, um, mental liberation and you know mental emancipation to uh, to our inner city schools is a beautiful idea that uh, that a friend of mine was uh, is kind of championing in Fayetteville and trying to trying to make happen with that yes, uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhist school that they you know uh, program that they have over there. I just wish love that idea. I hope it happens. What's that? <laughs> Uh, as important as the inner city kids learning this type of stuff, I just wish we could get our parents on board. <laughs> oh, right on. Yeah, totally. We should probably start with Congress. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a, 
it, but yeah, man, for sure. I think we all, you know, could use some, uh, that's one of the things I, you know, I don't want to get too political on here or anything, but like, I feel like that's one of the sad, uh, things about our current state of the political landscape is that, uh, our, our mainstream religion, you know, Christianity has basically been, and it like, you know, I'm not saying Christianity doesn't, doesn't have flaws for sure, you know, but it's like, it's sad that our culture's main, main religious identity has been totally hijacked by one of the political parties and made it to where it's uncomfortable and people don't want to identify with it for a lot of reasons where it's like, you know, I feel like a lot of people have been stripped of their, you know, like some form of ceremony or, you know, like if they don't have any kind of archaic ceremonial you know psychedelic type stuff like spiritual spiritual practices you know helps humanity you know like having something there i don't know i feel like that's just like we're kind of in a in a spiritual thirst in america because like one, our our biggest religion has kind of been appropriated by a political party and kind of ruined i'd say you know what i mean like the religious yeah. right side has lost their credibility completely you know and what even led to christianity going down that path was the fact that it was influenced to be instead of a religion of personal evolution and personal responsibility and essentially spiritual compassionate anarchy which that's what the original teachings of the gnostic christians was about to becoming a right. messiah. it's a savior complex messiahistic religion now it even like i remember when i was a kid in church i was told all the time works alone will not get you to heaven well all yeah the i know heaven is potentially earth or hell is potentially earth. It's de it depends on oh, what yeah. we create here. So if we want to get to heaven Absolutely. on earth, we actually do have to do some work. That's what I've come to realize. And that means doing the right thing. Absolutely, also. man. And it's such a crazy concept to me that you just don't have, you can just make a mental imaginary agreement with something and you don't have to do anything to like it's garbage. earn being good. <laughs> it's just the craziest, it's the laziest concept ever really. You know what I mean? It's just like, oh, I want the benefit, but I don't want to have to actually do the stuff you got to do to get it. Like, you know, I mean, I hate to keep using this word. Always been it's silly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, and then that just leads people to want to look at the uh, the Messiah as the the government leader that ties into this. But you're you're a philosophy guy. Are you familiar with the the phrase Hegelian dialectic? Um, I define it for me. Okay, because that's what this is with the, the Democrats and Republicans. And it, a Hegelian dialectic is when you have seemingly only two choices, but both choices are actually being manipulated by somebody else to achieve the same result. And oh, that's yeah. what's going on with basically everything in politics and every divisive aspect of our culture. It's just a bunch of Hegelian dialectics designed to get people to take sides when in reality – there's infinite choices beyond just a, a Republican government or a Democrat government. You know, there's actually right, red, red or blue, right? Yeah. There's so <laughs> many shades out there that we're not being offered because it doesn't, it's harder to control, you know? I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a big it's puppet show. Opposition, yeah. Actually it, it, it's opposition that can't, it's, it cancels out all possible social change because you have two sides that equally um, energetically block each other from, the issue advancing that's what i see it yeah. as yeah no i agree that's a great uh, description of it actually uh, but yeah i love i love that phrase I, I was not familiar with that really but that's uh that's really interesting idea uh but that's yeah man and i think we finally hit the the uh, the the if if all of this has been orchestrated programming i think the show just jumped the shark this season with uh <laughs> with trump you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, uh, it's like it's got to be a reset button somewhere around here because it's uh you know we're clearly things are out of hand you know i'm interested uh -huh. to see you know, what this what the swing back will be on the next uh you know the next few years man it's we're kind of headed down a weird road uh right now but it's going to be i have great hope you know i feel like the technological advances in our general like younger generations um kind of awareness i think all of us growing up on the internet and stuff we're, we're a whole new generation's coming this i don't think all this old shit is gonna you know i don't know i'm just i'm hopeful that all this international political intrigue is like we're kind of hopefully heading to a state where we can be on more of a enlightened level with one another you know i mean for god's sake we've got the ability to auto translate between every language now you know what i'm saying we've got we can speak <laughs> wirelessly with each other across continents and shit like 
communications are there. We just got to like use them now and, you know, unite exactly. the people together. It's, it's I, I always feel like 99% of the actual people out in the world, like, uh, or we're all basically out for the good of it. You know what I mean? Like the, yeah. like that fake, that, that fake, uh, uh, duality, the, the dialectic you were just talking about. It's like that, you know, that, those are like artificial things that are presented to us to, to create division. But like, when you get past all that shit and past national barriers and stuff, I mean, we really, humankind is, is basically good. I feel like, you know what I mean? Like there, we, we're all intrinsically more on the, you know, we want good for for ourselves and each other in general, you know, and uh, that's a beautiful thing. We're, we're very social community based organisms. Uh, and uh, so there's, there's great hope for the future in that, you know? Yeah. That's one of the things that they served you as a, as a dialectic that because human nature is so bad and they really pump this in through religion, that we actually have to have something called the state that has a monopoly on violence. Otherwise there would be chaos when actuality, right. the state is the agent of chaos in the world. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it creates the, it creates the, the monster and then kills it for you. Uh, you know, well, how, how or supposedly you does the yeah. problem of theft, rape, murder, and uh, and fraud by giving another group of people the supposed right to steal, murder, and kidnap and lie to people? <laughs> how does that? Yeah, solve? exactly. How, how, I've always thought, like, how, you know, we're sending we're sending soldiers into our into foreign, you know, sovereign nations to snipe people out and shit like what if people were doing that to us? You know what I mean? Like we're, we're we kind of like deal out a lot of cards as a nation that we don't, we don't want dealt to us. You know what I mean? On a, on a basic level of violating some golden rule stuff, you know? Uh, yeah, man, the golden rule is all that you need to know. And what I think makes it even simpler is if you do the apophatic golden rule and apotheosis sure. in philosophy is the, is the realization of truth through negation. It's when something you can't describe what it is, but you can describe what it's not and therefore narrow down your idea of the thing. And in terms of the golden rule, the apath apathetic golden rule would be don't do to others what you wouldn't want done to yourself. It's a lot simpler than right. doing as you want to do unto yourself. It's even better. Right, right, right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I like that a lot. And that's the half that gets forgotten. <laughs> the what you don't want to do. Yeah. Um, that's that's great, man. I think I'm gonna update that in my records for how I can how I can think of that, you know. Yeah, man. Uh, I can come to a lot through apotheosis. Uh, that's actually a great way of understanding what your rights are as well, because we have so many actions that would be our natural right that it's too much to name it all, and that's why there wasn't originally supposed to be a bill of rights in the Constitution, but the. Uh, Again, not that I'm a constitutionalist, but I, the founding fathers did have some interesting writing, despite their flaws. And the the apothea, apotheosis of truth would just be like, or of of rights would be, you don't have the right to steal, you don't have the right to kill somebody. You basically, don't have the right to take something that's not yours or to accost somebody. And that's actually where, you know, if, if we could really all connect to that, then we could get rid of the government dialectic because. Anarchy doesn't mean chaos, it, which is what everyone's programmed to think it means. It means no rulers. And if there's no rulers, then there's no slaves. And if everyone is internally taking care of their own self, um, responsible for their own self, their own thoughts, behaviors, and actions uh, completely, then that, that makes them a sovereign individual. And then you could have ex anarchy externally in the world because uh, if it was all made up of sovereign individuals, that is actually what I consider to be the nature of the, the positive nature of tribalism. Because in a tribe setting, our ancestors could never have had a hierarchical structure, even though there were elders that were respected and listened to because they had wisdom, which is another way of saying they spoke the truth. You were not able to control groups of people to do what you wanted, make them do what you wanted them to do, because what would you use to hold over them? They can gather their own food. They can build their own hut. They can create their own clothes. They can go off and leave you. So there's no controlling that. So that's why personal responsibility and self-mastery are actually essential components to the true state of freedom. I know, man. <laughs> hey, man, yeah, let's wrap man. this up. Oh, um, I'm really glad we could catch this time while you're driving. I think it went great, despite the fact that you know, you're a pretty good distracted driver, I'll say. I didn't hear any, like, horns honking or, oh, shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a uh, master of the art of going 
going way below the speed limit in the RV, dude, just because it's, <laughs> it's like the comfortable route. And then you don't have to deal like everybody, the, the water just flows around me. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody, everybody's flying by. So I'm not creating, trying not to clog up the traffic, just like slow lane cruising, you know? Yeah, man. Just keep, keep it steady. <laughs> Right on. Keep it between the ditches, as they say. Hey, what do you got? What do you got for people to check out? Like your website? Um, the, any- oh yeah, man. I've got a. Uh, glad you asked. Uh, man, people can find me at uh, uh, Jamie C Photography on on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, Jamie dot com is my website. Uh, also have an Etsy store with uh, prints and stuff, posters, uh, and uh, that's uh, under the shop name Jamie Seed. I can't remember the URL for that, but they all interlink and stuff. Of course, you know. And, yeah, uh, I like just, to all of it. Yeah, I would encourage everybody to reach out to me. You know, like uh, uh, let's, let's keep up with each other. You know, support each other as much as creators out here. You know, do it, everybody out here doing our thing. You know. Yeah, man. The more of us that get involved with a different way of uh, creating community the more support each member of the community has. Cause there's one more person there saying, fuck yeah, dude, you got this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was one more light shining, you know, like it's a, it, it's like a big old, uh, you know, I don't know, man. It's a big, beautiful community of people doing, you know, doing things they love out there. Uh, let's just keep shining them lights, man. I love the mission of your podcast. Um, it's an honor to be on here again, man. And, uh, always much appreciated. Great conversation. And, uh, you know, keep doing what you do, brother. Hey, right back at you. You inspire people left and right. And most importantly, you make people feel good about themselves when they're around you. And you show true, unconditional love. I've never seen anything else from you, man. You're one of my personal inspirations out there in the world, uh, showing me what it looks like to be taking responsibility for yourself and taking creative action as the priority to, you know, what your life is about, actually being free to have that expression and brave enough to jump right into it. And I'm sure you, you know, you didn't do it all at once and you took your steps, but the, the place you're at now, it's, it's great for all of us out here to see that it's totally possible. We can all be, we all be Jamie seeds. And I hope everyone realizes that and resolves to be just as shiny as you <laughs> in the coming years. Oh man. It's huge for us, <laughs> for sure. Thanks again to the very definition of a super homie, Jamie Seed, for coming on the show today, even while he had to do a big drive. This conversation had pretty much everything I love to talk about, including music festivals, art, flow toy culture, and rebellion against the powers that should not be, and of course, some of Jamie's personal story and what he's currently been up to. If you want the entire conversation, you got to make sure that you're a plus subscriber on patreon.com forward slash interverse, where you can load your own private RSS feed for plus. There are quite a few perks available as rewards to subscribers, but the plus extensions are definitely the best part, where in this episode, for example, you'll get over 45 minutes of expansion about Jamie's personal journey, what he's up to lately, and more of a lot of expansion on the ideas that we touched on in the first hour. You may have noticed there are no ads in the show, and the only support that the podcast receives is from subscribers, so if you've liked any of my chats up till now, you probably can't go wrong with doubling your weekly episode content, right? Check the episode notes for links to Patreon, to jamieseedphotography.com, and for links to the music featured in this show, which is Total Fire, from the super heady DJ Suhan. So friends, it's the end of the year, and also the end of Season 3 of Interverse. And probably a good time to do what other people do and reflect on what all that means to me and talk it over with (laughs) y'all. I'll start by saying that this is a world with a trillion shiny things out there demanding your attention. So I think it's supernaturally special that you've chosen to spend some time with me here. 
whether you're a new listener or someone that's been supporting the show from the beginning, think about this. Every last turn of each and every molecule in the history of the universe all led to this moment right now where you're hearing me say this. It's trippy to look at the world in this way, but I do like to think about that because, you know, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm at a kind of hard point in the podcasting journey to where sometime in the future I'm going to look at where I'm at and see that where I'm at now led me there. <laughs> and, you know, where I'm at right now is the kind of place where for a lot of people it would be really easy to just give up and come up with a good reason like, well, it's just not taking off like I hoped it would or... Who am I to think I can create something that's actually helpful to others when I don't even have my own shit together the way I want it? Instead, I'm finding, though, that these thoughts don't really enter my mental dojo, because when they do, they're immediately karate chopped with my awareness and intention to keep doing what I love doing. It's actually extremely fun for me to have conversations like this, and I'm so happy when I'm putting together these episodes that I don't really care if our community here ever grows that much at all, although it probably will. And my life is incredibly wonderful, magical, whimsical, and good in just about every way that it could be for my current stage of development as a soul, especially when looked at in relation to a lot of other people out there, which is never really good to do. But in my case, when I look at other people, I think I do have the superior life. <laughs> I'm lucky like that. So I want to thank you again for both giving this podcast your attention and for all the things that you've done this year to try and be a better version of yourself. Because you put that energy into the field and it makes it easier for all of us to do the same. And we're going to need as much of that positive evolutionary energy as we can call forth. Because, you know, we're, next year we're going to see all kinds of crazy shit happen. It's going to be natural disasters and violence and also beautiful, subjectively perfect moments that are unique to each one of us. The world is only going to get stranger, and it's doing so in a hurry. And I don't know where to go with this ramble. So I'm just going to say good luck with whatever you seek to create in 2018 and beyond. And I hope to be a small part in motivating you with carrying forward in that work, because I like to think about life more deeply than the surface level, and I want to take you guys with me and keep asking that all-important question together of who am I or who are we? So I'll be taking a short one-week break, and then I'll be right back in your ear holes with Season 4 of the podcast. Thank you for listening. I hope you know that you're magical, you have infinite value, and you can create any life you dream of. Except, well, there are some exceptions to that. Like, I could never become a 400-pound African pro wrestler because, you know... There are some physical limitations to that, but I could pretend to be one, and that's just as good. <laughs> anyway, I love you guys. Thanks for listening in 2017, and I will talk to you next year. Bye-bye.
time you heard it like this.